All right, we are at 727. I'd like to call to order the regular council meeting of the District of Seashelt. It is Wednesday, February 5th. We have an agenda in front of us. Um, are there any errors or omissions? All right. I'd like a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Oh, is there any conflict of interests? I am declaring a conflict on item... 10.6. The trellis rezoning. I'm a uh, staff member of Vancouver Coastal Health, so I'll be excusing myself for that. Thank you. Any others? So, uh, motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. We have two delegations this evening. Our first is David Reed. I see him back there. He'll be speaking to us about Coastal Workforce Housing Society. Please come up and turn on the microphone. And I think we've given you 10 minutes for your presentation. Look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Push the button on the, yeah, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Seeger, councillors and staff. Thank you for the invitation to present the council. Our society was formally formed on July 19, 2019 as the BC nonprofit. Prior to that, it was a committee for most of the year comprised of members of the community futures and various local professionals and business people. Our volunteer board consists of myself, Kim Darwin, Glenn McLugan, Janice Iverson, Rick Cooney, Spencer Keyes, Mark Yellowly, Clarence Lee, Colin Stanfield, Brian Smith, Chris Hergesheimer, who's on sabbatical, Sarah Zacharias, and recently Kirsty Tozak. I'm sure names you're all familiar with. Our objective is to give workers on the coast clean and affordable housing. Our vision is to build multiple unit apartment style buildings that are affordable, near transit and stores, and that have social and amenity areas for both socialization and possibly daycare during the day. We are not location biased and want to serve the whole lower Sunshine Coast. We are not looking at building just a building, but a series of buildings over time that can serve what will be a growing coast. Our occupants will have to be full-time employees, and they'll have to prove it, bringing up to the guidelines per type of unit and qualifying net worth. Requalifying will be annual, and properties will be professionally managed. This endeavor is about more than just housing. As we all know, there is a significant shortage of desirable and affordable rental accommodation. This goes beyond typical workforce and includes safety, health, and social service workers, the lack of which is evident and takes away from our welfare and our security as a society. We have to make the coast available and affordable to attract younger families as we know that they are the future. Recently, we have been approached by local service providers who are expanding because of increased needs. They will have to hire more caregivers, and they are interested in what we are doing because they don't know where these caregivers will live. So, in summary, we don't have just a housing shortage on the coast. We have a housing crisis. And the advent of short-term rentals has aggravated the situation. But it is a phenomenon that exists, and we have to work around it or control it. And controlling it is a challenge for our local governments. We are in the process of engaging a consultant to help us with our request for proposal to BC Housing, because that's where the money comes from. This should be submitted in April, and hopefully we'll be qualified for funding. But this is a competition for BC Housing's dollars. 
Our challenge is to find suitable properties to include in our request for proposal. This is our main task right now. This whole process takes funding and we are in the process of seeking assistance. So far, we have been very well received by Mayor Siegert, Beamish, and Lori Pratt of the SCRD. Thank you for your support and your encouragement. We are also reaching out to our local MP, Patrick Wheeler, and Nicholas Simon, our MLA. We want them to be aware of our crisis and our program to try and solve it. We will need both a push and a pull to get this done. Nicholas was extremely supportive of our quest and be, will be working his side of the street in Victoria. The coast is only one of many areas in the province that has this problem, but we want our voices to be heard. As time goes by, we meet many people and see many phenomenon. Recently, one of our board members by, was approached by an HR person at the hospital. They had an experienced nurse ready to be hired, but no place to live. Our member thought outside the box and used social media to find a rental. Within hours, she had 14 replies. Upon investigating, she found that many people had units but didn't want to rent and be part of the pitfalls of a Landlord and Tenant Act in the event that they had a bad tenant. Having a nurse as a tenant gave them comfort. So a decent home was made available and the nurse joined our society. This gives us a thought that we could affect a clearinghouse or a rental registry of available properties with the contract being between the business owner and the homeowner to perhaps help get around the act. We do need some advice on this. Two of our board members have formed a task force to look into this now. There was a system like this put together by Scredo, but it has become inactive. We are in the process of activating and possibly modifying this system. Although it is not part of our original vision, it does meet our objective of getting decent roofs over workers' heads. Presently, we don't know if there are only 14 or 140 places available, but we will find out. Again, funding is always an issue. We will be applying to C. Shelton Gibson's funding programs and some others that are available. Once we have an accepted request for proposal, we will go to the business community with a more in-depth plan and ask them for their financial support. We will also be asking the towns that we build in for help with taxes, other building costs, BD building permits, increased density to make this more economical. Our plan is to build modular as the cost can be lower and the construction time shorter as there is not enough labor on the coast to build by hammer and nail. So we thank you for the opportunity to present and update you on our task. We appreciate the moral support that we have received and we look forward to seeing you all at a ribbon cutting ceremony. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Council, any questions of Mr. Reed? Council McLean. Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you and your organization for everything that you have been doing. Um, I think there's a lot of power in sharing the stories of workers who are looking for places to live. I think the example that you provided is a great one. Um, and I, I want to encourage you to do more of that. Um, and I'll be right there with you in trying to share those stories. Um, because like you say, there are a lot of potential rental suites available. Um, but we need to share those stories that um, 
the community does have this great need. So those personal stories, I think, can have a major impact. So I like that you're thinking a little outside of the box and outside of a physical building. Um, I think that's the stuff that's going to make a long-term uh, difference um, along with the building. Um, so not much of a question, but that's what I have. <laughs> that's a great comment. Thank you. Okay, I have one question for you. You said you're going to be looking uh, to BC Housing in April for funding, and you're looking for approval. Do you not need to have a, a site identified at that point? Or I, can... sh I sure do. <laughs> I'm working right. hard at it. Right. So you have to have the, pro the property of, of identified and kind of under contract or something, right? I have to have it under some degree of contract to be taken seriously, yes. Okay. Okay. And that's a challenge. Yes. Yeah, we've talked offline we, about that. Yeah, we have things um, under tow uh, that I have to keep here. Yeah. Um, so we're hopeful. Mm -hmm. But that's a challenge. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor McLean. Um, so I just want to make clear, how can we support you in what you're doing? Because you are doing good work. Um, I think I heard a, a potential funding yeah. request coming up, um, but if, if there's any other ways that we can support you, I just want to be 100% clear on that. Uh, once we fi find a, um, a property... Hello, hello, hello. Okay, hello, Tom, can you hear us? Okay, you so are unmuted. <laughs> Tom, are you there? Tom, are you there? Yeah, you I'm are here. muted. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So once we find a property, if it's in your jurisdiction, uh, of course, timeliness of a building permit, um, relaxed parking requirements, increased density, uh, reduced taxes, all of that's going to make a difference because most of the performance that we've done on properties that we've been looking at um, obviously lose money. So um, we're competing throughout the whole province um, for BC Housing's money, and they're going to pick the projects they like the best. And the more economical we can make them, that's one of the five or 15 categories that they're going to be looking at. So we're working on angles, the political angle, the economic angle, whatever we can do to uh, get BC Housing's favor, because that's where the money comes from. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, David. Thank you for coming, presenting okay. to us. And we wish you well. And please, as you know, if there's anything that we can do, reach out. Great. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Next, we have Tina Perot with the SCRD talking to us about details from the budget. And you have some other staff here with you. You could perhaps introduce them. Thank you, um, Mayor and Council, uh, for allowing us to present our 2020 uh, financial plan. We've just concluded the budget, and behind me I have our General Manager of Infrastructure Services, uh, Ronko Rosenboom. We have um, our General Manager of Community and Planning, uh, Ian Hall, and we have our uh, new CAO, uh, Dean McKinley, with us. So uh, They're here to, to back me up and answer any questions I can't. <laughs> so, so thank you. So, um, for today's presentation, I am just going to be going over. Uh, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> it's like Pavlov's dog. I got to jump or something. Uh, so, I'm going to be going over just a little bit of introduction of the regional district, our financial planning process. We'll talk about some of the key impacts coming for 2020 and some projects that came forward. And these are projects that uh, relate to District of Seashell particularly. I uh, will also talk about some of the budget figures after we concluded round one, and we'll also touch on the hospital district and conclude with any questions uh, Council may have. 
So, of course, the regional district covers the whole, in, uh, the whole of Sunshine Coast, and today we're going to be talking about the district and seashell in particular, and of course acknowledging within traditional territories of the seashell and Squamish First Nations. Uh, the SURD provides about uh, 20 distinct services to the District of Seashelt, and the regional district has about 45 distinct services that it provides to uh, various Sunshine Coast communities. And um, we have over 100 distinct budgets that we have to go through in our budgeting process, so it is quite long and, and uh, complicated. <laughs> So from a service delivery model, only those services that properties receive, or uh, whether they're business or residential, will be uh, taxed for those services. They're delivered in any combination in those electoral areas. Uh, we might have everybody participating in a service like regional solid waste, or we might have something that's just localized like a wastewater plant. Uh, we can also have services that are delivered via contract, and an example of this would be our memorandum of understanding and service agreement with the Seashell Public Library behind us here. TAC rates for regional districts are also um, unique in the sense that we don't have one uh, tax rate. Each service has its own tax rate, and so the taxpayers are generally also uh, tax based on their property and assessments. So just to touch a little bit on overall assessments, and of course these are the preliminary assessment values, and I'm sure um, everybody's certain uh, that essentially overall the Sunshine Coast has decreased over the prior year by approximately 2.1%, and our converted values have uh, reduced by about 1.6%. We just touch on this because it really is important in a regional district model because it these impact the piece of the pie of what all the participants uh, pay for in a service that they might participate in. And so I'll highlight a little bit of this because, uh, of course, we've just reviewed our new assessments. We're going to be getting them again and again. The numbers have already shifted for uh, various services. So from a high level, uh, we're over $13 billion of assessed values on the Sunshine Coast um, and our non-market changes. So those are directly related to growth in, uh, in the area. So that would be new units, new construction. So that's gone up about 0.79% from the prior year. And market changes refers to uh, an example of uh, your neighbor sold their house for X uh, value last year, and so we see a decline by about 2.89%. So on the Sunshine Coast, the majority of our assessments come from the residential class. Um, and here in the District of Seashelt, and again, these are our preliminary values and they'll change again, uh, we see about 85%. So the majority of tax base in a lot of our areas are uh, dependent on the residential tax base. So uh, just transitioning to the financial planning process, um, our process started in October where we brought the preliminary uh, proposals that the staff were considering to bring to the board for consideration at the end of October. And again, highlighting that the board's strategic plan was just newly adopted on October the 12th. And so we were heading in from one process to the next. Uh, we also held a special libraries meeting on October 31st, and that brought all our reading rooms and libraries for, from all areas to discuss uh, services that they deliver and, and whatnot in, in anticipation of the budgeting process. Concluded round one on December 4th, um, 5th and 6th, and we also have our community partners and stakeholders who present, so those would be things like the museums or community schools and various services that we partner with. Uh, public pre presentations or things like this to member municipalities, um, and uh, tomorrow I think on Coast Cable, the elected officials will be uh, having phone-ins and presentations as well. And we are heading in next week to our round two budget deliberations on the 10th and the 11th with anticipation of our bylaw adoption at the end of the month. Those timelines are a little bit um, advanced of what we typically do because we usually adopt our budget at the end of March, but we're trying to uh, work towards a December 31st timeline so we can get started on our project sooner. So here's just a snapshot of some of the key strategic focus areas of our board's new strategic plan. And of course, the, this is really one of the key drivers in how some of the projects are being contemplated for this year. Um, our financial 
planning process, of course, starts with the board's strategic plan. Um, and this year, what staff presented were also some departmental or corporate plans. So we did what we called service plan lights. And the purpose of that was to provide the board a little bit more information on what services uh, are delivered, what their high-level work plan are, how many resources are allocated to those resources. So budget proposals are also uh, contemplated based on a rating structure. And so things like mandatory proposals are given high consideration. Those would be things that really there's not much um, options to do things, things that are that are eminent asset failure, like a roof leaking, uh, something where we have new regulatory compliance items whether they're WCB regulations that we need to meet. Of course, the next highest priority would be board and strategic goals. And things with low cost, high value would be, uh, you know, something that have good bang for buck, like improvements to our audiovisual equipment in our boardroom. <laughs> Some of these are inside jokes. Uh, so from an overview update, um, impacts, we do have items that prior to our budget deliberations have some financial implications. And those would be things like contractual salaries and benefits. Uh, this year, the regional district 2019 was the end of the collective agreement, which is currently under negotiations. We also had some commitments to increase our financial contributions to our li liabilities for closure post closure. And just to give you an idea of where we're at, at the end of the 2018 financial statements, we had over $5 million that was underfunded for our future uh, closure and post-closure liabilities for our Seashell landfill. So we're working towards making sure we have funding for those future obligations. Again, we have a lot of operational contract increases. So what we used to pay for a service, we're seeing that those costs have inflated quite significantly. And again, uh, proposed increases for our utility rates, whether there are regional water rates that we heard just uh, approved last month. So we also have several carry forward projects, but those are rolled into the budget and don't have any financial implication. So just to give you an idea of the uh, number of projects that are being um, contemplated for this year, uh, we have 66 projects that are um, in draft carry forward for next year. So those are projects that remain still a work in progress from prior years. And we had 133 new projects coming forward during the round one. Um, we typically only have an average of about 70 new projects that come forward. So we're already at about 200 projects that are being contemplated. And coming into round two, there's, a, there's several new initiatives that are coming forward as well. So there's just a breakdown here of where the proposed funding is to come forward. So just to give you a general idea that taxation for the regional district, about 200,000 or so, is about a 1% overall increase. And so th that number is quite different depending on what services you participate in and uh, how much that percentage is for the District of Seashelt. Um, we presented that at the start of round one as well. So we also have our community partners and stakeholders. The regional district funds about 1.37 million uh, for our community partners and stakeholders. We had $53,000 worth of new funding that was approved um, or that was presented with 28,000 approved. So I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that are being um, contemplated. And these are projects where the District of Seashell would be uh, participating in these services. And these are things like our, our general government. So whether there are public engagement platform, updating our website, those are things through general government. Um, and right down to the bottom where we have our regional sustainability doing a community emissions, our greenhouse gas inventory was also presented. So from our planning and community development side, we have a regional housing conference partnership, and I think this is um, important, especially prior delegation. So we also have with the Sunshine Coast Emergency Planning a mass communication system. So that's in case of an emergency that there's sort of a call relay to everybody. 
Uh, we also, in our community recreation facilities, important to understand that we already fund a significant amount of capital improvements there, and this is just um, some additional ones. And in Dakota Ridge, we're seeing a few projects there where we haven't seen them um, in past years. In regional solid waste, there's lots of improvements to be done at the Seashelt Landfill, and just bringing your attention to one of the more um, significant or important items, and that's the, the Future Waste Disposal Options Analysis Study. So what, what that means is we understand that our landfill is, uh, has a, a life expense, expense, expectancy that is nearing the end, so you know seven years or so, and so we need to understand what the future of that will be for the community. So in our water utility services, uh, just to give you a few stats, there was uh, over uh, 33 projects just in the regional water service that were presented for the board's consideration. And these are just to highlight uh, some of the more material projects in cost. And so several reports have also been presented subsequent to this. And again, some of the highlights are the groundwater projects, uh, things to maintain our infrastructure. So these are things like the Cove K pump stations, Chapman water treatment plant, and of course the um, things related to the raw water reservoir. From our community partners and stakeholders, uh, we still have uh, some funding decisions to be made. And so those are the things that are being coming to round two, uh, but again, we've seen ongoing funding for our community schools, our youth programs, and our museums uh, got an operational increase of about two and a half percent. So just to dive into the numbers at a high level, we're at a almost a $56 million budget, um, and that's just after round one. Uh, we have an operating budget of $42.94 million um, and a, capital, a preliminary capital budget of $12.94 million. From a taxation, and this value, uh, again, is right after the round one deliberation, so they don't take into account the changes from assessment that occurred at the start of January. And again, what will happen, these numbers will change again when we get the final assessments at the end of March. Um, so we were at about a 6.66% uh, for an overall increase for the District of Seashelt. That equated to about 254000 And overall, we're at about a 7.8% increase. Uh, staff, just to note that we're currently preparing the agenda to be distributed tomorrow for round two. So you will see some of these numbers will have already changed for next, um, for next week. So this just gives a general snapshot of where the taxes go or requisition by the District of Seashelt. Um, the majority of taxes do go to our recreation and culture. And again, those do include the recreation facilities, but it also includes the museum portion of that. Um, from a tax rates and user fees, we always make sure to incorporate uh, what the tax rates are. And again, um, we have the parcel taxes as well. So we provide this on an ongoing basis and can provide it to staff if, if requested. So from a preliminary staffing plan, um, at the end of round one, we're at about 200 um, FTE full-time equivalents for this year. Um, for the round Two budget deliberations, um, there will be some staffing uh, resource implications due to the lofty work plan that will be also discussed. So where are we headed for uh, next week? We're going to be completing what final carry forwards need to be done. We also need to address our year-end surplus deficits uh, because, again, if there's any service of the regional district that has incurred a deficit, we need to address how that will be funded. Um, because of course we're not we don't have a general pot so each service has to um, make up their own funding we have several functions that are pending decisions and those are through general government emergency telephone um, regional water community recreation and those are just highlighting some of the ones that district of seashell participate in but uh, from our community partners and stakeholders, uh, still a decision regarding the Seashell Public Library funding. Um, and there's a few other uh, community groups that are coming forward for um, budget asks. So touching lastly on the Sunshine Coast Regional Hospital District, the provisional budget was adopted last October. 
And uh, one of the things to highlight is that Vancouver Coastal Health has come forward at the end of last year and uh, a subsequent meeting in January to decide how, uh, if that was gonna be incorporated and that was approved and that's that last item on, on this slide, which is that there was a cost share request of approximately um, 922,000 for the Sunshine Coast Hospital District, which was approved to be incorporated in the final budget. Um, so that's to be funded from reserves, so there's no, um, no tax implications um, for the hospital district for that. So it's looking like taxation uh, for the hospital district will mirror somewhat very similarly to last year. So that concludes my presentation. If there's any questions for myself or any of my colleagues behind me, we're happy to take them. Come up with some tough ones. <laughs> Council, any questions? <laughs> Councillor McLean. Okay, so if we could just scroll back a couple slides to the tax rate and user fee summary. The table. That's the one. This one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that a comprehensive list of all the services that Seashell participates in? Yes. Yes, okay. And then furthermore, um, does all of Seashell participate in all of these services? Because I know in other areas it can be segmented. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, Do all taxpayers in Seashell contribute to all of these services? Yeah, sure. I think the answer is yes. I do, I, I was looking because there's some where, for instance, recreation, community recreation is uh, only taxed on improvements. So if you are a property owner that owns bare land, you actually wouldn't, contri you wouldn't have to pay for community recreation. Generally, Generally yes. Okay. Yep. All right, good question. Any other questions of Tina or the staff? No. Councilor Rowe. How much longer for the recreation facility debt, does that come off soon? So uh, we took that borrowing back in 2007, and so we have till about 2026. Um, and why I say until about that time is because uh, with Municipal Finance Authority, there's a sinking fund, so if we do well, there might be uh, you know, a year or so that we might drop off, but it's 2026, I believe, is on our financial statements. Thank you. Councilor McLean. Um, you mentioned that we're doing a lot more projects than previous years, um, but I noticed that the amount of capital funding is going down. So in 2019, it was 14.96 million, and 2020, we're looking at 12.94 million. So does that mean we're doing less capital projects and more operating projects, or am I? Yeah, what's going on with that two million drop? That's a good question, and that's because a lot of the projects that are still to be uh, determined. So, for instance, the groundwater uh, project, the Church Road project, was not incorporated in, it wasn't approved because we didn't know the number quite yet, so that was presented um, just recently. So after the round one budget delivery, and then that again is a, a $8.27 million project. So we can see, you'll see this number will spike when the final budget's adopted. And so we do update all this information when the final budget's updated, and we do put that on our website. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I'm wondering if Tom has any questions. Maybe we can take Tom, can we try taking Tom off mute and see what happens? Okay, Tom, do you have any questions on the, on the budget information that Tina presented, which you've got in front of you? You are unmuted. You are muted. You're off. 
Yeah, Tom, we can hear you. We can hear him, but he can't hear us. Okay. We'll get this sorted in a bit then. Okay. We're not going to ask him any questions. <laughs> we'll probably have him sign off and sign back on again. Um, there's no other questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you to staff for joining us. And we'll let you go. You don't have to stay through the rest of the evening. <laughs> Okay. So, Jen, I'm going to ask Tom to sign off and sign back on again and see if that makes any difference. You don't think it will? He's making noise. Like... Isn't that Tom we're hearing right now, though? So he can, we can hear him, but he can't hear us. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been texting with them. Tom, if you can hear me, can you wave? No, he's not. He's not hearing me. No. If you turn my, our mics, if our mics are off, we can hear him. But as soon as he comes on and our mics are off, Tom, if you can hear me, can you wave? Are you trying to wave? I think I saw a hand, but. Tom, are you there? So we have two proclamations. The first one is uh, Toastmasters Month, February 2020. Whereas Toastmasters International, a nonprofit educational organization, is a leader in making effective oral communication a national and international reality for all persons, and whereas Toastmasters programs help people develop skills in speaking, listening, and other vital skills that enhance leadership potential and foster understanding, and there are four active Toastmasters clubs on the Sunshine Coast that meet regularly to continue to promote the goals, vision, mission, and core values of Toastmasters International. And whereas Toastmasters International has designated February as Toastmasters Month, now therefore I, Darnelda Seegers, on behalf of the District of Seashell Council, do hereby proclaim that February 2020 shall be known as Toastmasters Month in the District of Seashell. Thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, Second proclamation, Darwin Day, February 12, 2020. Whereas February 12, 2020 is the anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin in 1809, and whereas his work has made great contributions to the human understanding of our world and the universe we live in, and whereas the understanding led to and continues to lead to advances in technology, medicine, and philosophy, and whereas those advancements through the efforts of the women and men of science have helped to relieve suffering and prolong life, and whereas the District of Seashelt is rightly proud of its commitment to scientifically-based environmental awareness, appropriate technology, and progressive education, now therefore I, Darnelda Seegers, on behalf of the District of Seashelt, do hereby proclaim that February 12th, 2020, shall be known as Darwin Day in the District of Seashelt. So we're going to move on to item 5.1.
minutes of the 3.30 regular council meeting of December 11th. I look for a motion to adopt, moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, minutes of the regular council meeting of Wednesday, December 18th. First, are there any errors or omissions in these minutes? Seeing none, I'd like a motion to adopt. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Those are long ones. All right, uh, item 5.3. Minutes of the 3.30 p.m. regular council meeting of Wednesday, January 22nd. Any errors or omissions in these? Seeing none, a motion to adopt. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Any business arising from the minutes? Nothing? Okay. So let's move on to committee meetings. Minutes of the Committee of the Whole Meeting of December 11th, 2019 for adoption. Amendment, Amendment in there, Councilor McLean. Page 59, under the second bullet, and it was further noted, second bullet, uh, the WRC has potential to create more revenue for the district without an impact on taxpayers. Um, I believe that should have been Dusty Road, not WRC. Anything else? All right, I look for a motion to adopt the minutes as amended. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Thank you. 7.2, minutes of the Advisory Planning Commission meeting of January 7th for receipt. Moved, Moved and seconded, all in favor of receipt? Thank you. Uh, business, let's do one more and then we'll come back to business arising. Minutes of the committee of the whole meeting of January 22nd. Amendment, Amendment in there, Councillor McLean. Okay, page 67. Under recommendation two, the final bullet, um, rural reserves in 2020 are being spent on Trail Avenue reconstruction. That should be roads reserves. Okay. Any other amendments? Motion to adopt as amended. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And then you wanted to address some of the items, Councilor McLean. Yeah, APC. Um, on page 63, the APC made a recommendation that Council consider amending bylaw terms of reference regarding quorum to consider increasing membership numbers and recommends there be an interview process to review duties and expectations of the program. Um, this sounds like an interesting proposal. Um, I'd like to learn more and receive a full report back, so I'd like to move that staff prepare a report um, with the intent of APC. Okay, is there a seconder for that recommendation? Seconded, okay. Staff are okay with that? Did you want to address that now a little bit? I wasn't at the meeting, so probably. probably. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, staff are, are okay with that, and it's certainly on my work plan for the next one or two council meetings to present a report with updates on advisory planning commission, composition, respecting members, present members, expiring members, and recommendations for how to achieve quorum more consistently. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the recommendation on the floor? Thank you. Anything further from these minutes? Councilor McLean. Uh, more of a question, again, from APC. Um, one of the things that they noted on the Wade proposal um, was for getting it moving forward. Um, so when can we expect to see that? Thank you. 
Thank you. Excellent question. Uh, we are pleased to see that this application has, has revived and gained some new momentum. Uh, the APC um, received it well, and there were some comments for the applicants to consider, and they're looking at um, the end of February for public information meeting, after which we will report back to, to Council with recommendations for next steps, which could, in fairly short order, hopefully include public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to that one coming before us. Anything else? All right. So let's move on to bylaws. We have bylaw 8 point, uh, Section 8.1, Council Procedure Amendment Bylaw Number 568-2. Over to our Corporate Officer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a housekeeping item uh, for Council to consider some amendments to its Procedure Bylaw. Um, I've set out the proposed amendments in my report, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions that Council may have. Any questions from... Council. So I look for a motion to receive the report, first of all. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And then there is another recommendation there. How would Council like to proceed? Councillor Scott. I'll uh, move to uh, recommendation two. Council proceed, giving first, second, and third reading. The Council Procedure Amendment Bylaw 568-2-2020. There's a seconder for that recommendation. Right next to me on this side. Okay, all in favor? <laughs> Thank you. So let's move to the bylaw. Hang on one second. I'm just texting Tom again. I'm going to have him sign right out. Okay. So this is District of Seashell Bylaw Number 568-2-2020, a bylaw to amend Council Procedure Bylaw Number 568-2018, and I'd look for first reading. Moved and seconded. All in favor of first reading? Thank you. Um, and second reading? <coughs> Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And third reading? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. So, new, no new business. We'll go to number 10. Um, item number 10.1. Ms. Rogers, come on down. <laughs> I'd look for a motion first to receive the report regarding District of Seashell logo. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Here we are again. Um, as you can see in your agenda package, we've got um, three logo options that you um, asked me to come back with to show you some pictures of what it would look like. Um, so I've done that. Um, interestingly, when we, the, the second option, we talked about reversing the colors to make the S stand out a little bit more. When we did that, we looked at it, we went, wow, we've just recreated the Gibson's logo. So it's not really one that I would recommend. Um, also, the, your third option um, looks, at first glance, like the district of Etchelt. Um, the S is lovely, but it really doesn't stand out. So um, I think the first option is the best option. It's the most versatile. It says who we are, um, and it's, it, it'll, it'll work on a variety of platforms. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Council, any questions? No questions? How would you like to proceed? There is a recommendation. Council McLean. Let's start with the recommendation. Recommendation two, that Council select option one as the dist new District of Seashell corporate logo, including all related branding materials based on the Seashell community brand. All right, is there someone to second that? Second that? Any further discussion? Councilor McLean. All right, so there's been a lot of discussion in the community about this. Um, to me, it comes down to how do we make our communications department most effective? Um, this is something that 
leads into a bigger branding conversation. It's just one part of the brand and how we present ourselves, how we communicate. And it's a very important part, but it is just that one part. So this one change will create a larger change within our communications that allow us to be much more effective in everything that we do in, in the communications department. And that's a critically important department because it affects pretty much everything else we do. Um, so to me, this is about efficient government um, and, and giving our staff the tools that they need to do to do their job well. So I'm in favor of adopting this new logo. Um, and I think I'm excited to see what will come out of it. Um, if we stay with the logo, it really limits our opportunities to innovate in what we are, are doing to present to our community. Um, so a new logo, a new brand will help us push us forward, be more effective, and try out new things and new messaging to be more effective. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to comment? All right, so we have a recommendation in front of us. All those in favor? Any opposed? And we'd like those recorded? Thank you. Tom? Tom can't really vote. It's passed. I've asked him to sign right off and come back in. All right. Thank you. All right. Item 10.2, Seashell Arts Festival. Let me just get to that. Seashell Arts Festival. Uh, first, a motion to receive the report. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And is there anybody here speaking to this? Yeah. Corporate officer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this report is seeking council's support of uh, the annual federal grant application that uh, the um, Seashell Arts Festival Committee makes to the Canadian Heritage Branch. Um, as I say, this is a yearly, the Council has supported this for a number of years now, and in essence, uh, this is a, a grant that only nonprofits can apply for, so our role as a municipality is to, to support the, the committee's application should Council wish to, to continue with the Seashell Arts Festival. This grant contributes approximately 25% of the overall revenue for, for the arts festival, so it's quite an important one. I'll also note, you may have noticed this, that Siobhan says in her report that the deadline is January 31st for the grant. No worries. Uh, as you may recall, the January 15th council meeting was canceled because of the snowstorm. So we went ahead and submitted the application with a note that should council not wish to proceed, we'll withdraw the application. Otherwise, it's, it's been submitted. We just need to, your ratification. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? So recommendation is that we support staff's uh, application to this program. Moved and seconded. That council direct staff to complete the Canadian Heritage Forum confirmation of support for municipal government or equivalent authority with financial information supplied from the 2020 draft budget. All those in favor? Thank you. Move on to item 10.3. Renewal of temporary use permit 2016-01 and application for non-farm use in the agricultural land reserve for the Rogues Arts Festival. Rogue Arts Festival, sorry. And motion to receive the, re the report first. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Thank you. And I turn it over to staff, thank you. Thank you. I'll keep this very brief. Uh, the report speaks for itself, but this is uh, essentially a renewal of a temporary use permit for the Rogue Arts Festival. That uh, takes place on Tyson Road at Clark Road, uh, Clark Farms. Uh, it's associated with a non-farm use application as well. It was previously issued in 2016 for a term of three years, along with the original temporary use permit. And council now has an opportunity to renew the temporary use permit for an additional three years. And this will then authorize an application to the ALC for non-farm use uh, permission again. Uh, should Rogue Arts Festival receive that, then uh, they could hold the festival for another three years. If the ALC chooses to deny at that point, uh, the temporary use permit would lapse and uh, would not be active and uh, they would have to make alternate arrangements. 
happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Councillor Rowe. Have there been any issues arising out of the event for bylaw or anything else? Uh, no, I checked with our bylaw uh, department and there was two uh, noise complaints uh, associated with the music on the weekend. Um, those complaints were within the hours that they were permitted to have amplified music and the festival made uh, arrangements as best as they could to deal with that. Uh, there have throughout the years been some reconfiguration of the site to uh, change the location of the, of the music uh, venues to provide more buffer, but um, overall just two complaints. Any other questions? So there are two recommendations. How would council like to move forward? Councillor McLean. I'd like to move recommendation two that council renew temporary use permit 201601 for an additional three years to August 31st, 2022, subject to ALC approval of the non-farm use application. And I'll move recommendation three that council forwards the application for non-farm use to the Ag Agricultural Land Commission and recommends approval of the application to allow a three-day arts festival. Is there a seconder? There's a seconded. Any, all those in favor? Thank you. And Tom, can you hear that? I think he's on, he's on the phone. Okay. Next one. Move on to item 10.4, temporary use permit for a uh, read of Pedals and Paddles Adventure Sports at 7425 Seashell Inlet Road. First a motion to receive the report. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And back over to you. Okay, and this will be even shorter than the last one. Um, this too is a, a renewal of a, an existing temporary use permit uh, for the Pedals and Paddles business. Um, this one, um, by considering the renewal offers them the ability to continue and to allow them more time to consider um, more permanent arrangements and for staff to consider as part of the zoning bylaw review how to um, consider these types of uses uh, in the future, uh, whether we want to make them permanent or, or simply uh, continue uh, with rezoning or TUP applications in the future for, th for this type of use. So this um, buys them some time to continue with their existing operation, which um, basically has had you know, no issues, um, and buys them time to consider what, how this use would be incorporated in a more permanent way in the future. Thank you. Any questions of staff on this one? So there is a recommendation in front of us. How would you like to deal with this one? Councillor Cooster. I'll move recommendation number two, that council authorize a renewal of temporary use permit 2017-02 for an additional three years to February 5th, 2023 for foreshore lot 6102, Seashell Inlet, BC file number 0162895, and that the portion, of the, the portion to the west of Seashell Inlet property of the property north half of district lot 1410, except part dedicated as road by the deposit of plan 11948 PID 015651-282. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded. Any other questions, staff? All those in favor? Thank you. Aye. Aye, okay, good, I hear you. <laughs> and I saw your thumbs up, awesome. I got that, thanks. All right, we'll move to item 10.5, Board of Variants. This is summary and appointments. And first a motion to receive the report. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Thank you. And okay. <laughs> over there. Uh, thank you, you? I, I'll take this one. Um, so the Board of Variants term expired in and around the same time as uh, current mayor and council was elected and it appears as though this is likely not coming in front of you in the year you've been in office. So I wanted to put this forward before I come back with names for appointment recommendations because it may be new to some folks. Um, now, a Board of Variance is required. It's mandatory for any municipality that has a zoning bylaw. And although the members are appointed by council, they are in a sense independent. Um, they sit independently and they do receive occasionally 
application referrals for variance, which they, the Board of Variance itself reviews, hears from staff, hears from the applicant, makes a decision. So those particular applications do not come to council. The vast majority of applications are handled through the development variance permit process, which do come to council. But it is incumbent upon staff to accurately describe both application types to application to applicants, and then they can choose which they um, which path they wish to pursue. And so, this report here provides a little bit of background. There is no clarity within legislation about hierarchy or why the development variance permit process was introduced when there was a long-standing board of variance process. But the board of variance does have some limitations respecting minor and respecting hardship, and then some avenues for non-conformity as well. So the Board of Variance is a little bit more limited in scope than Development Variance Permit. Nonetheless, what we have here is a Board of Variance, a group of three, their term expired in 2018. Pursuant to the legislation, they carry on until otherwise a new term is appointed. I did reach out to the members, two of the three members confirmed that they wish to seek another term. That said, I, I indicated to them should we receive um, direction this evening from Council that while their request for an extension may be received fairly, it would be the most fair for them to submit the same as anybody else would through public notification and advertisement. And assuming I receive direction, we'll proceed with that and report back at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions the director? Councillor McLean. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, just quickly, I would prefer them to reapply and just to, as a fairness note. Um, the question is, um, why hasn't the Board of Variance met? Was there a lack of items or did things get deferred to Council? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I've, I've scanned through the files and it seems as though there was, um, the last application was I think 2017 and it was turned down. So there might be a higher level of confidence for applicants to go to Board of Variance. And this arose with the, the application that um, Council reviewed last month, the, the Nygaard application. I, we described the, the premise of each process and, and they chose the Development Variance Permit route. And it made me realize that we need to reinvigorate our Board of Variance. But there is no clear indication why Board of Variance has been lightly used in Seashell over the years. But my professional experience in my career is that development variance permit is more, is utilized more often. And it's likely due to the restricted, restricted parameters of the Board of Variance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so there are recommendations presented. I'll move recommendation two and three. The district uh, advertised seek three members of the public to serve on the district seashell board of variance, and then recommendation three that the that after the advertisement period, staff report back to council to consider appointments to the board of variance. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Tom said yes. Tom said yes. We have we have Tom. All right, so we're moving on to item 10.6. So Councillor Rowe is going to recuse herself. She'll be out sitting in her car. Did you take your keys with you? Okay, good. So item 10.6, subject is trellis rezoning application, Silverstone long-term care home, permission to proceed, West Seashelt Derby Road at Cowrie Street. First a motion to receive the report. Moved and seconded, all in favor? Thank you. And we'll turn it over to staff. Okay, yep, so we have the uh, rezoning application 
um, to amend both the official community plan and the zoning bylaw um, for the Silverstone long-term care home. Uh, basically, um, in the same location as previously proposed, um, although now the, the road is constructed, um, basically on, on the new section of Derby Road, uh, where it intersects with Cowrie Street, as identified by the star here. Currently, there's a, a large pile of rock um, where a part of the, the site would be, but it's um, the property that would be created would be, you know, sort of in this general area. Um, it's basically a 132-bedroom um, institutional operation, um, 128 beds, plus a, a four-bedroom hospice, um, the application also notes that the, that four-bedroom hospice could potentially become an eight-bedroom um, unit in the future. Um, overall, it's uh, a mix of two and three stories, depending on where you're looking at the structure. Um, at its highest point, it would be about just under 13 meters. Um, so when we're looking at the OCP policies, it talks about uh, institutional care facilities and looking at comprehensive development approaches. Uh, standards of urban design and accessibility and how does the proposed use fit um, with the neighborhood, uh, looking at issues of form and character uh, and, and associated amenities for the neighborhood and the, the institutional use. Um, as outlined in the report, what we're trying to do um, in seeking permission to proceed is um, basically get direction from council to start working on bylaws, but also raising a number of issues and questions for council to consider as we move forward um, around issues of affordable housing and staff housing, community amenity contributions, uh, as well as um, more specifically for the, the proposed institutional use. Um, you know, how will this integrate uh, into the existing and future neighborhood, um, access to and from the site, traffic generation, um, as well as uh, while a, a development permit cannot be uh, required for this type of use, we can still deal with uh, development permit type issues uh, for form and character of the building, uh, landscaping, site design. That can all be dealt with through the rezoning, so that's something to turn um, your mind to uh, in terms of how this fits with the neighborhood, how it fits on the street. There's existing residences that are already being constructed right across the road, the surrounding area will be predominantly residential, a mix of single and multifamily. So um, how, how best will this institutional use be fit, um, fitted into the neighborhood? Um, uh, generally, uh, the, the process will be, um, you know, like tonight, seeking permission to proceed uh, at a future council meeting, bringing back um, bylaws for first reading if council gives the go-ahead, uh, followed by a referral process. Uh, public information meeting, and then second reading, public hearing, third reading, uh, Ministry of Transportation approval of the zoning bylaw is required as it's within the 800 meter buffer of the highway, uh, and then at some point in the future potentially considering adoption of the OCP and zoning amendment bylaws. So just quickly running through um, some plans, this is just a, an overall site plan of the building basically a, a central core structure with four wings, um, plus the hospice attached to, to one wing. Um, and you see that this is Derby Road along here, um, the entrance off, off of there. So that's one of the, you know, some of the issues that we're raising for, for staff and council to consider moving forward is um, what does this look like? It was there a need to maybe set this back further, issues of buffering, screening from the road, how does that interact with uh, the street and the neighborhood? So those are things to keep in mind, um, how, to, how to move forward with that. Um, and then each wing uh, is separated into its own sort of residential housing unit um, with multiple floors. Um, so portions of the building will appear as three stories or two stories, depending on um, how it sits. Um, basically, the wings um, will be two levels with the central core structure um, being as three three levels. And this is just an approximate um, image from the applicant on what the, the final form and character might look like, just to give you an idea. So if you have any questions. All right, council, any questions? Okay. Um, any comments, concerns?
Can I go ahead? And I'll, I'll follow. Okay. Um, so let me find my notes. I have a statement from Councillor Toth that he'd like me to read. So this is his words. Um, it's about time we got this moving forward. Public health care is, is of course the preferred way forward in our community, but the province has said it isn't happening. We need this, and the only thing we as council should be considering is land use. I think Trellis would do well to seriously consider some workforce housing, but I'm not willing to require it of them. So that was Councillor Toss words. As for myself, I tend to agree. Um, we could fight this, costing staff time and taxpayer money, or we can work towards a design that supports this neighborhood. We had this conversation with Minister Dix and Nicholas Simons, and they are adamant that this will be a private facility. I, I choose to put our time into things that we can control and not fight a losing fight. It's going to be a private facility, so I choose to accept that, and now we need to discuss planning and development issues. Okay, so yesterday, Isabel McKenzie, uh, BC's Seniors Advocate released a report reviewing the contracted long-term care sector in BC. <clears throat> the review examined industry contracts, annual audited financial statements, and detailed reporting on revenue and expenditures for the years 2016-17 and 2017-18 for both for-profit and not-for-profit facilities. So there are many people in the community emailed council to ensure we knew about the call yesterday with the Seniors Advocate where she reviewed the findings of her report. So I was traveling, I took my husband along so I could actually have him drive and I could take part in this. So I listened in and I also reviewed the material. So what the seniors advocate, advocate indicated was that the province lead needs better monitoring of care hours, tighter financial oversight, and more transparency within the long-term care sector. The current funding and financial reporting is disjointed differs between health authorities and is unaccountable to the public. And the quote from the report that she put in, she said it is the job of regulators to put in place monitoring and reporting systems based on a trust but verify relationship. And the report concludes with five recommendations to the province to address the shortcomings. So I agree that these should be addressed and I would advocate for the province to put in the proper checks and balances. But it is up to the province to address these issues, not the municipality. That's their mandate. This evening, we're being asked to consider an application for a zoning and OCP amendment for a property in our community. That's a decision that's in our mandate. So I am in favor of the recommendation as here. So I turn it over to Council. Where are you on this? Councillor Kuster. I'm 100% I'm in support of this. Uh, this is something our community has needed for a long time. Um, I, from experience, not necessarily on the coast, don't believe that public versus private, there is a difference in care. And I know that's sometimes a, an issue with people in the community. So um, I'm 100% in support of this moving forward. Did you want to weigh in? No, I, I, I'm 100%. This, this needs to happen and sooner than later. And this is the path, that, uh, path that's going to happen. So we have a recommendation that staff have put forward. How would you like to proceed? I'll move recommendation two that council directs staff to proceed with developing bylaw amendments associated with the trellis rezoning application. And is there a seconder? Seconded. Any further comments? Mm -hmm. Council McLean. I got another statement, so let me find it. Okay, there's a couple things in the report that I want to address um, just for general information to start the conversation in terms of planning and development. Um, there's a comment about um, staff housing. I want to encourage the developer to build staff housing, but that is not necessarily affordable housing. On-site housing can only be considered as affordable housing contributions if the units are secured at under, the mar at under market rate. Um, furthermore, I don't believe this development is a community amenity in itself. I view it as a business. And when it comes to community amenity contributions, it should be considered as a commercial development. Um, this is not to say that there can't be community amenities provided on site. 
Um, I would like to see the proponent consider methods to bring in the public to the facility. Um, so using stuff like the daycare suggested or other um, things that could happen on site to bring the public into this building. And that's the kind of community amenities I'd like to see out of this. A um, couple other things. I want to also want to see if staff can work with the SCRD to determine how this development can lead to two-way bus service on Route 2 through the area. Currently, it only goes one direction. Um, I want to stress that this development should be part of the larger community and bus service in both directions with an accessible stop as near as possible to the development um, should be considered to bring staff and visitors to the property to make it part of our community. And finally, um, access to mature nature should be considered. Um, there's some nice looking trees in the area currently, um, so it would be really great if there was a way for um, residents of the facility to be able to get out and experience that fully grown nature that is already right there. So consider that before we chop down all the trees. Um, and I think that could lead to positive benefits, um, allowing the residents to get outside and enjoy the nature that is already there. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion in front of us. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Councilor McLean. Motion for a five minute recess. That sounds good. <laughs> we'll take five minutes.
move on with the agenda. We're up to council reports. So how about if we start with Councillor Scott on that end and move down the table? Start on that end? Okay, we'll start on this end. Councillor Kuster. Okay, in keeping with time, I'm gonna keep this one really short. Um, probably the most important thing that I did was attend the Youth Advisory Committee meeting. Um, it was our first meeting of the year. And uh, it's very apparent we have a lot of vulnerable youth in our community, um, a lot of risk youth from heavy addiction to abuse to homelessness. And um, it's just great to get together and see what kind of support system we have out there um, with youth outreach, community services, community schools. Um, Lori with your LGBTQ2 and the list goes on and on. So um, lots of good stuff coming up. Um, community services um, is heading up uh, it's Foundry BC, which is gonna be a hub for youth and they're in the convening stages right now and that was pretty neat to see. And lots of different activities happening in the community for the kids, um, like youth pop-ups and um, Oh gosh, <laughs> community schools, they have different um, cool school days for the kids and uh, just amazing that all the um, people that are supporting our youth out there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Housing Advisory Committee met on January 9th um, and we're continuing our focus on encouraging people to develop accessory dwelling unit units as a form of market rate rentals. Um, so we're gonna be putting out a survey very shortly um, to help understand um, from citizens what they wanna see uh, would help them make the decision to build an accessory dwelling unit easier. Um, so look, we're looking forward to that um, and really diving deep into what would be required to get more of these things built through the private market right now. Thank you, Councillor Rowe. Uh, I had our meeting with the uh, Community Investment Program Grant Committee and our two new members who um, are great. So we're just beginning the process of um, shortly reviewing all the applications and meeting again mid-March to make those decisions. Um, just for a little fun though, <laughs> There's a few nurses and doctors uh, and a couple other members of uh, hospital staff who on April 7th at Seaside Centre are going to shave our heads in support of Sunshine Coast uh, mental health youth programs run through community services. So I'm just in the midst of sort of getting that organized before I go away. So mark April 7th on your calendar because it's going to be a fun little evening. And, um, and you know, I get I'll be to take the you. first one. That's right. A hundred bucks gets you a swipe with the razor, and uh, Darnell is my first donor. So, anyways, I've been bald before. It's not pretty, but it won't be pretty again. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Uh, I talked about uh, giving a report on the meeting with the Davis Bay Community Association on the wharf and in the email changeover all my emails and notes on it have disappeared and when I came in to see Bev yesterday she's not here for the week so I'm gonna wing it and uh, but basically uh, the Harbor Development Committee met with members of the Davis Bay Community Association out on the wharf to talk about the challenges going on out there with uh, with the fishing and uh, uh, accusations of poaching and stuff like that. We came to uh, basically brainstormed on ideas and realized that uh, the signage that's out there is not adequate and not probably in the languages that we need to address the concerns and issues. So there was uh, some requests for some signage uh, changes that, uh, that actively meet more of what we're looking for. Uh, there is, uh, they have to fix a uh, request to fix the, the bait table and the, and the uh, water pump that's there. That's uh, been broken forever. Uh, a request to have uh, the district boat go under and cut away all the fishing net and fishing line. 
and uh, items along uh, underneath it uh, that are causing a challenge. And uh, there was also a request to send a letter into the uh, DFO for another uh, survey of the uh, bottom and basically what the fishing stocks are like to uh, corroborate what DFO said at the meeting that day. So that that request is in with uh, Public Works right now. So hopefully we'll get some signage set up in the next little while. It'll require DFO approval and, and everything in the languages. And then I also uh, went to the community, the latest community association meeting. And one of their uh, other concerns and requests is they'd like us to submit a letter to the Ministry of Transportation and uh, to have a, a lit crosswalk uh, across from the pier where that crosswalk is to make it lit like like it, what they have at Mission Point. So that's their request is for uh, a support letter. And I, and I agree with that. We should submit a letter in support of that. So that's to the Davis Bay Community Association? That, to the well, they, they wanted, a, they'd like council to, to send a letter in to Modi in, and ask to have that crosswalk lit, crosswalk lit. Okay, so as a, so the rapid response indicator like in down at Mission Point? Yeah, same idea. Okay, so I can make a recommendation? Yes, I'll make that recommendation. Okay, and then we'll, we'll liaise with them around timing and who to go to and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. So recommendation that council send a letter to the to Ministry of Transportation to put in what what'd you call it a rapid response yeah, light is that like what that. they call rapid it response something the same crosswalk light that they have at Mission yeah. Point yeah, <laughs> yeah, rapid, rapid, yeah or, sorry whatever he said <laughs> yeah okay. um, is there a seconder seconder for that okay all in favor thank you anything else that's it. Thank you. All right. My report's going to be really short. Okay. Just a couple to... follow-up things. Um, first was there was also a request to send a letter to DFO to do some um, a survey of the fish stock. The stock. Oh, yes. I guess yeah. we should make that recommendation, yeah. too. Of course. So a recommendation to send a letter to DFO to do another stock reassessment in... Uh, yeah, I think it's particularly crab is what they're looking for. Uh, uh, we, we did have a report uh, done in 2012 uh, that showed the, the, the fish and stock levels and the crab levels uh, that was done as an assessment by one of the consultants in town in regards to the expansion of the pier. Uh, so I guess we can see if they'll fund uh, another assessment much like that. Seconded. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. One more, go ahead. Um, just a question about the, is, has any of the use of the dock changed? Or are we just looking at signage and cleaning up as mentioned? Well, there was no, I, I council's decided that uh, we're not gonna move with changing the, the usage of the dock as, with regards to fishing. So uh, while that still is what they would like, I, I personally am not in favor of it. I, I think we, we need to manage this through education. The other piece of that is at the, the meeting, the public meeting that they held, um, DFO actually said there was no issue with stock at that site. So part of the information is we need to verify those numbers that they're talking about, um, ensure that the education and the signage is adequate there before we go ahead. There are people in the community other than Davis Bay who actually go there and fish quite frequently. And uh, they've started to come out and say, do not close it down. So we need to do some more work around this first before. Go ahead. In that discussion, they went back to uh, the gentleman that made that comment that there is no, and asked for his where does he get his information to make that claim? And uh, there was no no science to back it up. It was just his feeling. So I think that's where doing a survey would, would definitely help. All right. I'm just going to report on a few things. Um, I had a meeting with the new appointed regional director, Mickey McCartney from Capilano University. 
they are coming out with some new plans for programs that they're going to be rolling out here. She was looking for uh, just a back and forth about uh, what we're up to, what they're up to, and how the, the programs would work together. One of the things that I requested she look into was with regards to the uh, program for daycare workers. So they are looking at offering both level one and level two coming up. What I requested was that she look at how they provide the instruction for level two. Because what we're finding in the community is if somebody takes level one, they actually get a job. And then they don't want to give up their job to go back and take level two. So is there some alternative way to provide the instruction? Evenings, weekends, uh, some online or something so that they can continue to work while they do the, the second course. So she's going to look at that. Some exciting things coming forward. Um, I had some questions for her. She has some questions for me. We're going to see where that goes, and then we'll bring stuff back to the community and to council. A number of us, um, Council McLean and I, I think, we're at the track bike shorts. This is track. Track put this on. They, did, uh, they went out and got short little videos or little movies from around the world. There was one from Copenhagen. Uh, one from the Netherlands, and then they rented the top of uh, 101 in Gibson's and showed these. They expected about 10 people to show up, and it was they ended up taking over the whole place. So they were really surprised at how many people came. But it was great to see the, the interaction and the engagement of the community up and down the coast on this, and it wasn't a very great, great like the weather wasn't great that night, so it was good to see people out. Sorry. Um, one of the things I thought somebody would mention is council conversations. So we had last week, Monday, we had council conversations at Rockwood. Um, Councilor McLean, Councilor Toth and I were there and we had, I think about 20 people showed up. And we split up among the different rooms and we just had conversations, so it was good. Looking forward to more. <coughs> Sorry, a tickle in my throat. Um, and then, as Tina said, budget Monday and Tuesday at the regional district. That's it. Sorry, choking on something. All right, then we have uh, Councillor Toth's report from the FCRD. Are there any questions on his report? No questions, let's move on to item 12.1, release of items from closed meeting. Councillor McLean. Uh, I guess, do we need to receive a report? I don't think there's... Okay, I will receive it from recommendation one. Thank you, is there a seconder? Seconded. All those in favor? Thank you. Aye. Thank you. And then we have correspondence for receipt. Move receipt. Seconded. All in favor of receipt? Thank you. Aye. And then um, item number two requires action by council. We did pass a resolution with regards to this community resiliency grant application. Uh, they submitted that, and when they submitted it, they were it was requested that the recommendation be revised, as in the letter that's been provided on page 269 and 270. So on page 269 is the recommendation that they request we pass, and then they will forward that into the, to go along with the grant. Would someone like to make that recommendation? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Aye. Are there any others that you'd like to see addressed? Councillor McLean. Yeah, I'm going to pull them all out. So okay. let's start with the first one. The email from Teresa Logan, plastic bag ban. Um, so this is something that the Gibsons and so, several other communities around BC are leading on, um, but in my opinion, it's not on 100% solid legal ground. 
Um, however, who does have solid legal ground to do this is the federal government. Um, and they are talking about uh, doing something in 2021, which, believe it or not, is a year away. Um, so I think the biggest issue we have is the over-packaging of products. Um, plastic bags and straws are just simply the easiest, the quickest thing that we can do. They're not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is how much packaging goes into everything that we buy. And that's something the federal government can have a, a say on how much goes in. So I'm looking forward to the um, federal government legislation. Um, and I think our role should be on education. Um, so talking about with our citizens what can be recycled, um, talking about reducing consumerism, talking about shifting your, your buying habits. That stuff that is solidly within our jurisdiction that I'm 100% confident saying that we can do without going through a legal challenge. Um, so I think we've put away, aside some funds this year for our upcoming curbside program. Um, so I'm gonna make a motion in relation to that. I wanna move that council request a presentation on waste reduction communications work by the District of Seashell and the SCRD. So you'd like our staff to work with the SCRD staff and come and do a presentation on waste reduction or the SCRD staff who actually do that work to come? Well, there's two pieces. We're responsible for collection um, and they're responsible for disposal or the end state. So we both play a role. Um, and I believe we both do communications. So what I want to hear is an update of what our plan is for communications around waste. Waste or specific, like waste in general or specifically to plastic bags or plastics? Waste in general. Waste with in general. Ob the obvious intention about plastics. I just want to hear what we're doing. Okay. Um, I would... I would say after this, I mean, this is a recommendation that can go forward now, and uh, they will probably look at um, incorporating some of the budget proposals that are coming forward because they're they are looking at organics collection and curbside recycling and all kinds of things in the regional district. Okay, so that's a recommendation that we request our staff to communicate with the SCRD staff and that both come and provide information to us on initiatives that are moving forward with regards to waste and recycling and the communication efforts around and the communication those. efforts okay yep. perfect is there a seconder for that I'll second it <laughs> all those in favor thank you Aye. what's next um, we have a letter from the minister um, so this response was entirely predictive predictable um, they're doing a corridor study. They're going to put everything that we send to them in the corridor study. Probably same as well with this request for lights in Davis Bay. Um, the follow-up question I have is, are they talking to us about that study? Do we have an opportunity to identify the concerns that we know of, or are they doing this all from Victoria? Go ahead. Uh, probably a bit of both. Um, you know, we do have a copy of the initial report. We don't have the appendix, which will have the possible solutions to a lot of these problems. Um, I think once they make a presentation to the SCRD as a start, uh, they'll see where it goes from there, and then we'll find out more on the timelines. Uh, in the meantime, the SMT is trying to arrange to meet with the two local area managers for Modi to go over a number of our specific issues. The Torito. Um, Flashing light is a perfect example. I'm not sure that they understand what we're talking about there. We weren't asking for a full stoplight intersection. We were looking for something to do with the pedestrian end of it. Um, it's the same thing. If we make the appeal for Davis Bay and they don't like the idea of having two of them blinking that close to each other, what are the other options? We want to have some conversation about it. So we just thought if the SMT met with those two guys, we could find out what the hesitation is or what the issues, is, and then we can come back to you on that front. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Scott. Those, uh, maybe uh, Darwin can comment, that, that flashing light down at Mission Point, do we know what it would cost, what it costs to put that in? 
$150,000. Holy cow. Okay, thanks. So the answer was, when he asked how much it was, the answer was about 150000 Okay, for the record. All right, last item in correspondence. Yes, this is regarding a request from the province to change the name of Wilson Creek, both the creek and the community, to Socom, a First Nations, or Seychelles Nation uh, word. Um, so it's a very interesting proposal, um, and recognizing it, indigenous names for places is a valuable exercise. It recognizes that settlers took this land and that land has, this land has much more history than um, settlers typically recognize. It, it, uh, recognizing indigenous names also normalizes the speaking of the Sishishalem language for indigenous use. It's, and it sends a message that it's okay to embrace their culture. So in that spirit, here is the proper way to say um, Sokum. Bear with me. I have this all planned out. It was gonna work. So I don't know how well that translated into the mic. Um, my attempt at that is Sokum, um, which is not a perfect, but I need to work on my shisha shape them. Uh, so, Um, so recently the SRD worked with the Seashell Nation elders to come up with alternative Shishishalem names for many of their parks. I want to see us do a similar approach to naming places in the district of Seashell. Um, I'd like to take some time to sit down with the Seashell Nation Council, as well as encourage some staff-to-staff -staff connections to work together to find the best places to incorporate Shishishalem names. In the meantime, I have a couple questions about this proposal that's in front of us that I want to look into. Um, first one is, why rename this community in particular? Um, are there other places that the Seashelt Nation sees that's important to have a Shisha Salem name? And does Socom in, replace Wilson Creek in all instances, or is it just something on paper that we never refer to again? Um, and finally, how do we create a community conversation around this? Um, so I think hopefully this is just the beginning of a conversation um, and hopefully we can get answers to some of those questions as we move forward before a decision is made by the province. Thank you. So we will be having, I mean there is a new election, right? Election for the new chief on the 15th. I think we could probably Put this aside for now when we meet with them whoever that is we will meet with the new council we can bring this forward and have a conversation i agree this is this is a conversation with them and with the communities before we actually even respond to this so i think we can let staff just kind of put this on the side and put it on an agenda for an upcoming meeting that we'll be having with them all right anything else in correspondence i think that's it right RCMP stats, motion to receive. Moved and seconded, all in favor, thank you. Any questions about these? So last, any emergency items? None, motion to adjourn. Moved and seconded, all in favor, thank you. Aye. All right, thank you, Tom, we'll let you go.